In this episode, I'm gonna introduce you to three different decision-making frameworks and models that I use both in my business and personal life to help me make tough decisions on a pretty much daily basis. Because it doesn't matter where you are or who you are or what you're going through, we all have to make decisions. Some of these are small and minor, almost inconsequential things like what to wear or what to eat. And then we have those on the other end of the spectrum, those significant, very important and critical decisions that require a little bit more mental energy to make sure that we don't mess it up. These are things like what business or career opportunities you wanna pursue, who you may wanna partner with, or what goals are worthy of your time and your energy. What's more is that one of the most interesting things about success and about achievement and something that almost nobody ever talks about is how the more successful you become, the more decisions you're going to have to make and the more powerful and important important they're going to become. So now is the time to figure out a good system to help you think strategically, evaluate different options objectively, and come up with a plan to help you make tough decisions and make sure that they're the right choices for you. And that's my goal for introducing you to these three powerful mental frameworks and models that I use to help make tough decisions. But here's the deal. While all three of these different frameworks and models are incredibly useful, my advice to you is to listen to them all, but then select the one that sounds like it's most in alignment with you, with your personality, as well as with the decision that you have in front of you. Then over time, as you get a little more practice and a little more experience making tough decisions, well, you can start to mix and match different components from different frameworks and models. So you can end up with a completely customized strategic thinking decision-making model of your very own. So let's start with the first one, the five-step decision-making framework. The very first step to this framework is to define and really identify the problem or the decision that you have in front of you. So what is the problem? What's the choice that you've got to make? And if it is a problem, really make sure that you're addressing the root cause of the problem and making sure that this isn't just some kind of symptom that's a result of a problem that you really should deal with first. Next, time is a powerful thing and can be your ally here. So make sure to ask yourself this choice that you have to make, this problem that you have to deal with, well, does it need to be dealt with right now? Or can you sleep on it? And maybe it'll just go away on its own or resolve itself naturally. The flip side of that is you always have to take a look at the risks involved if you choose to ignore the problem or ignore the decision in front of you and just do nothing. And more often than not, inaction is going to lead to greater damage than doing something. Finally, it's important to measure all of this against the end goal or the outcome or the objective that you want to achieve. After all, if you're faced with a certain decision that you have to make or a problem that you have to try to solve, it's incredibly important to try to figure out what you're hoping to achieve by doing this. Okay, next step, gather information. In this next phase, you really want to make sure that you do your homework, do your research, do your due diligence to make sure that you've got all of the facts and all of the information and possibly even all of the advice and opinions in front of you so you can look at things objectively and clearly with all of the data. So talk to different stakeholders. These are going to be people who are going to be impacted or at least affected or influenced by the decision or by the solution that you're proposing. An example here, if you're considering changing jobs and moving to a new city, well, the stakeholders would be your family and your friends. And it's definitely worth having a conversation with them before you just pack up and move. Also make sure to talk to mentors. These are people who have been where you are, they've gone through what you're going through, and they've possibly made it through the other side with some ideas and some insights and some wisdom that they can pass on to you. While it is true that no two people are exactly alike, there's a lot to be learned from other people who've been in a similar situation to you. Next, time to do some fact checking and read some books, read some articles, listen to some podcasts, watch some videos, study some case studies, research some research papers. I don't know, just basically read stuff, consume information, try to collect as much data and facts and studies on the decision in front of you as humanly possible. The bigger the decision, the more important this stage is. And I assure you, no matter what decision you're contemplating, there's a ton of information out there for you to simply do a quick Google search on and basically occupy yourself for the next many hours, if not many days. Once all that's done, Try to be a little objective and step back from the situation and ask yourself if you're missing anything or if there's something that you haven't considered and you'd be amazed what just might pop up. Okay, next step. Now you wanna develop and evaluate different options. So here's where you really wanna brainstorm all of the different options available to you, whether you're looking at making a difficult choice or you have a problem that you need to solve. It's time to put everything out on the table, lay it all out and see what you got in front of you. As the saying goes, there are no stupid questions. Well, when it comes to brainstorming, there are no stupid ideas. Everything's 
something's got to get out so you can look at it objectively. Your brain is amazing for creating ideas, but it's terrible for storing them and for remembering them. And it's also hard to evaluate them objectively when they're just kind of dinging around inside. So write them down. And then once you've got this messy list of ideas in front of you, well, it's time to start editing and to sort of call them down, trim them down and figure out the best options. And then once you have those, well, now you can flesh them out a little more as well as start listing out the pros and cons of each one. Once you've done that and you've sort of measured them against each other, taking into consideration factors like the time investment or the culture change or the impact on friends or family or finances or whatever it is, well, it's time to choose the best one. Now, here's one of the most important pieces of advice that I could ever hope to give you. No solution is perfect. You simply want the best one that you can choose based on the information and the experience and the conversations and research that you have right now. Also, don't be afraid to consider a compromise to maybe take the best parts of one solution and pair them up with another or to choose one direction but leave the door open for another. There's a lot of talk in business and entrepreneurship about burning the boats and about really setting yourself off in a forward direction and never looking back. And sure, there's a time and a place for that, but there's also a time for being a little more cautious and a little more careful. At the end of the day though, there is no perfect solution. There's only the best one for you right now. There's an expression that I love that says we don't make right decisions, we make decisions and then we make them right. And that leads me to the next step, which is to implement and then monitor the decision. There's another horribly cliched saying in the entrepreneurial world that is, there is no failure, there's just learning. But it does have some merit. And the reality is, is that if you make a good decision and you advance something that you're seeking to advance, again, remember the importance of laying out the objective and what you're hoping to achieve. Well, if you make progress towards that, things are good and you've made the right decision. On the other hand, if you don't quite get where you were expecting to go, there's probably a number of different reasons that led to the lack of a satisfactory result. And this failure, I mean learning experience, well, it's gonna provide some cues and some clues for where you may want to adjust or pivot or head next. So if things turned out successfully, then try to identify which parts were most responsible for the successful outcome so you can do them again and replicate the process. If it was unsuccessful and it provided a learning experience, well then try to identify where things went wrong or what needs to be corrected the second time around. Now, as useful as that is to help you make difficult decisions and evaluate problems and come up with ideal solutions for them, what do you do when you just really can't decide? Like I mentioned earlier on in this video, as you become more successful, the amount of decisions you're going to have to make increases exponentially and the amount of opportunities that are gonna be presented to you, well, they just never seem to stop. At first, this sounds amazing until you realize that you can't possibly do all of the things all of the time. And that's depressing. Unless you have a formula or a system to help you evaluate decisions and make sure that they're moving you in the right direction for you and for your goals and for your dreams and for the objectives and outcomes that you want to achieve. Hence, I came up with something I call the Atom Algorithm. It's totally weird to name something after yourself. However, this really was never meant to be shared and is just an internal tool that I use to help me make the right decision and to evaluate different opportunities that are presented in front of me. So, like I said, feel free to take the parts that apply and use them and take the parts that don't apply and discard them. Let's dive in. The way that the Atom algorithm works, and that still sounds weird to say out loud, is that I start at the top and I go through a number of different decision-making criteria. As long as I get a yes at the first one, I proceed to the next step. If at any point I come up with a no, then I stop, probably not the right choice. So the very first thing on the list is what I call the awesome factor. I first learned about this from Derek Sivers in his book, Hell Yeah or No, which basically says you either have to be totally excited and amped up about this opportunity, or you should probably pass. This is because we do our best work when we're excited about something, rather than just doing it because we feel we have to. Now, full disclosure, this is coming from a very privileged space that I've developed after a decade of sacrificing and doing a whole lot of things that were less than awesome. Many many less than awesome things were done. So if you're at the early stages of your career, of your business, you can feel free to table this one until later, but it's still an important consideration to keep in mind. The reality is, is that life is short, your time is precious, and again, we're gonna perform better when we actually care about something. So if that gets a check mark, then I head on to the next question, which is all about ROI. Now, ROI stands for return on investment. And essentially here, any opportunity that I pursue is going to have to pay me back in some way, at least one-to-one, -one, meaning the amount of time or energy or money that I I put in is going to have to get at least that much back out. Otherwise, I don't really consider it. If it looks like it is going to pay off though, maybe not now, but at some point in the future, then I give it a check and I move on to the next question, which is all about time. And essentially asking, is this going to take a lot of time or just a little time? Now, using terms like lot of time and little of time, 
It's kind of subjective, but you're going to have to apply this to your life and to your business and to see just how much free time you really have to allocate to this project. The fact is, every time you say yes to something, you're essentially saying no to everything else that could have occupied that space. So you've got to think critically about it. If I feel, however, that the time required of me to pursue this direction or make this decision or pursue this opportunity is worth it, then I move on to the next step, which is all about lifestyle. This question is really about figuring out if this new opportunity fits and is in alignment with me and with the kind of life and the kind of business that I want to build. Now, in order to do this well, you first need to do a bit of a deep dive into yourself and into your goals and into your values and, and your priorities, figuring out what's most important to you right now. For example, it could be time with family and making sure that you're home every night for dinner and you never work weekends. It could be about growth and learning opportunities and pursuing things that are going to challenge you and push you in ways that you weren't before. Or it could be about freedom and autonomy and having complete control over your decisions and over your actions and over the life that you want to live and who you want to work with and how you want to work. For example, when I was first getting started in my career, well, I pretty much worked all the time. It was a terrible, terribly unhealthy choice, but at the time it was something that I felt needed to be done. So it was seven days a week, 16 hours a day for way too long. Well, I've dialed it back to something significantly more reasonable, which gives me more time for my family and more time for my friends and more time for the things that matter most to me. Once it passes that test, well, I move on to the next selection criteria, which is, does it match with personal development? In other words, are there learning and growth opportunities? And is this going to make me better in an area that I view as important to me? Again, this is important to identify your top three values, which could be, say, your family, it could be your health, and it could be your finances. Well, if that's what's most important to you, you better make sure that this opportunity, this choice that you're trying to make, is going to contribute in some way to one, if not all three of them. If it gets a pass on that one though, I move on to the next selection criteria, which is the deathbed perspective. Now I appreciate this one is a little bit morbid, but it's still incredibly important and it gives you this valuable perspective to imagine yourself at the end of your life, looking back on all of the decisions you made and the opportunities you pursued and the ones you ignored. Really spending some time to imagine yourself as the future version of yourself, looking back. And then asking yourself, laying on your deathbed, was I glad that I made that decision? If the answer is yes, then you pretty much are good to go. If the answer is no, and you think you're going to regret it later, you should probably pass. There's a famous article by Bronnie Ware on the top five regrets of the dying, and this is what she found out. First, most people wish that they'd been more authentic and they'd been more true to themselves. Next, most people really do wish that they'd prioritized friends and family and relationships rather than just work. And most of them wish that they'd chilled out a bit, calmed down, relaxed, and taken some time to just look around, smell the roses unless they're allergic to roses. But if I get the green light on that one, then I move to the final question, which is all about the confidence level. And this is essentially looking back over all of my answers and asking myself on a scale of one to 10, how confident am I in all of the decisions that I just gave? Like I've already mentioned, all decisions involve some level of risk, but if this number ends up at a seven or above out of 10, I feel like I've got a pretty good fitting on it. All decisions do involve some element of risk. There is uncertainty. There is this level of the unknown and really having no idea Idea what the future holds. On the other hand, if I end up with like a six or a five or a four, heaven forbid, a three or a two, well, I'm going back to the drawing board, which means I'm going all the way back to the top of the algorithm and I'm working my way back through it again till I end up at the bottom, confident that what I've decided is the right choice for me, at least right now. Nine times out of 10, this helps me make a really good decision, one that I feel comfortable with and confident in pursuing. But what do you do when it's that one out of 10 times? You know, when you got a decision and it just freaks you out. Well, that's where I'd like to introduce you to an exercise that I first learned from Tim Ferriss called fear setting. Fear setting is interesting because it's like the complete opposite of goal setting, where you essentially list out all of the worst possible case scenarios. You imagine them in vivid detail and then you kind of experience them in advance and realize that, hey, maybe it's not so bad. Here's how it works. First, you need to define your nightmare. So this is the absolute worst case scenario. What is the absolute most catastrophic, disastrous event that could possibly happen if you make the wrong choice? Try to visualize these things in as much detail as possible. Really make them real. And then ask yourself, would it really be the end of your life? And maybe more importantly, would there be any permanent aspects to this? Would there be anything that you could just literally never recover from? You see, often we, as humans, we think in these terms of absolutes and concrete permanent aspects. We use terms like always or never, 
but things are rarely as concrete or irreversible as this. So ask yourself, how bad could things really get and what's the likelihood that it would actually end up that bad? Then move on to the next question, which is to ask if things did go that bad, what steps could you take to minimize the damage and possibly even reverse the steps to get back to where you were before? I'm betting the odds are pretty good that when you really think this through, it's probably easier than you would imagine to get back to where you were before, provided you didn't burn all of your bridges to the ground. In other words, be nice and it'll serve you well. Next, you wanna to try to visualize what are the outcomes and the benefits of more realistic situations and scenarios. You see, you've already had a chance to go over all of those nightmare situations, those worst possible outcomes. Well, now it's time to think a little more realistically, a little more rationally. So what are all the good things that could happen? And these could be internal things like increased confidence and self-esteem and knowledge and growth, or they could be external things like money or wealth or status. I guess money and wealth and status are all kind of the same thing. Or maybe experiences or adventure or an increased sense of freedom. So how likely are these things to occur rather than the disastrous situation? And how likely is it that you could produce at least a moderately positive outcome? And another great question to ask yourself here is have other people just like you, possibly less talented and less intelligent, well, have they managed to pull this off and make it work? Because if other people have done it, you can probably do it too. From there, it's important to ask yourself questions like what are you putting off because of fear? Reality is, is that the future is completely uncertain. We have no idea and our brains, well, they hate that. But the reality is, is that more damage is caused by inaction rather than taking action. Especially now that you have a logical and proven framework to help you evaluate different decisions and make sure that you're making the right choice for you right now. Now, all of those are an incredibly great start to help you make those tough decisions. But if you want a further edge, as well as some more ideas and tips to help you really become a more strategic thinker, then the next thing you're gonna wanna do is check out the video that I've got linked up right here on how to be a strategic thinker. So make sure to check it out now and I'll see you in the next video. And all of these decisions are just the remotely conscious decisions. When you factor in all of the unconscious decisions and the things that are taking place behind the scenes, well, this number gets frighteningly, staggeringly,